Timothy. We're going to pick up around uh, verse 16 or 17. Uh, the last thing we talked about was Paul the Apostle and his testimony. Uh, we learned that Paul in the beginning was called Saul. And he was a great persecutor of Christians. He was uh, zealous for the law, zealous for the Lord. He thought that he was doing God a favor by going out and rounding up Christians to be uh, imprisoned and even be put to death. We know he participated in the death of one of the great disciples. Uh, we don't know if he actually threw any stones, but it does tell us that he uh, held their cloaks while they stoned him. So, um, Paul was not a good man. He had a bad, bad past. But Paul's past did not disqualify him from serving the Lord. In Scripture, he shows us who he used to be, and now through the saving grace of Jesus Christ, he shows us who he is today. Paul is the great apostle. Uh, we know he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. We know he wrote first and second Timothy and also Titus, which we're going to study over the next month or two. Um, these three books are a guideline for a healthy church. We study it real good and understand it. It, it gives us a guideline on how we should operate a healthy church. We know he's writing to young Timothy. Well, not so young anymore. He's 30 now. He is the uh, pastor of the church at Ephesus. So we got to keep in mind as we study this tonight who he's writing to, what the culture was like at the time, and what these verses meant to this church in Ephesus at the time. Because we're going to get into some touchy subjects tonight if we make it that far. But I'm going to do my best to explain it from the very start to the very end starting with the creation story and see how it applied then and how it applies to us today. So, we're going to get started here. So Paul's just finishing up talking about his, his conversion on the Damascus Road. He says he considers himself the worst of sinners. Um, the, and I said last week, I said, you know, maybe we should focus on ourselves and consider us as the worst of sinners and not focus so much on other people's sins. And that's what Paul did. He, 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 in his mind, he was the worst of the worst. But it says, I'm going to start at verse six, uh, 16. It says, but for that very reason, because he was the worst of the worst, because he was such a bad man in the past, and because of this amazing transformation to what he become, after the Damascus Road experience, he says this, but for that very reason, for that reason I just explained, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his crystal in chapter, Timothy chapter 1, Thank you. verse 15. I'm in six, going to 16 now, Timothy chapter 1, or going to 17. He says, so that Jesus Christ might display his amiss Patience, an example for those who believe in Him and receive eternal life. Verse 17, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So what Paul's saying here is no matter what your past is, no matter what your past is, Jesus can save you. He can save you, forgive you, and use you to grow His kingdom. Here's the thing. Let your past be your past. Don't live in your past. Don't wallow around in your past. Don't have, have reservations about your past. Let your past be your past because Jesus has saved you. He's forgiven you for that past and He's given you a new life. Scripture says that we are a new creation in Christ now. So, all of us that are saved have a testimony. Some of our testimonies are, are worse than others. Some of us really never did that many bad things. We live a good life, but living a good life don't get you to heaven. 
The only thing that gets you to heaven is receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it means that you cannot do life without Jesus Christ. Like I said last week, we are all in the mud, but not all of us is sinking through the same depths. We're all in the mud. Some of us is sinking deeper than others. Let Christ come into your life. Give your life to Christ. Let your past be your past and focus on living your new life now. Verse 18. We're going to move on now. Timothy, my son. See, Paul here calls Timothy his son. And, and I wanted to bring up that something before we get to that. Where in verse 17 where he says, the only God. See, that meant a lot in those days that Christianity, they serve only one God. And he makes a point here that it's only one God. Because all these other religions of the time, except Judaism, serve multiple gods. Some Hindus serve some, I heard 300,000 God, just a crazy number of gods. So there's only one God, and that God is Jesus Christ. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. They all have a purpose in our life. Now he goes on to say, Timothy, my son. So he's taking Timothy, young Timothy, at the age of 15, and he's taking him under his wing. And he, he, if Timothy got saved at the age of 15, we talked about his mother and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois, were godly women who give their life to Christ and, and raised young Timothy up, and he had given his life. Paul actually led Timothy to Christ at age 15. Then he takes him on a missionary journey with him. So he's not really his biological son, but he considers him his son. I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies. This is interesting. We're keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So we're not sure what prophecies were made about Timothy, but undoubtedly some prophet has spoken words about Timothy, maybe perhaps what he would become in the future. And he did. He, he went on to become a great pastor and serve the Lord in a great way. So that by recalling them, you might fight the battle well, holding on to faith and good conscience, which some have rejected and so have ship, suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Now, verse 20 gets interesting. Among them are Hermenius and Alexander, listen to this, who I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. What in the world does that mean? That Paul actually handed over these two men to Satan. And what did they do? What did they do so bad? Well, we're told actually what Hymenius did, if I'm pronouncing that right. It speaks to him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, which we're going to get to. Uh, verses 17 and 18. Let me read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll get there in a month or so. Verses 17 and 18. All right, here we go. I better start at verse 16 for it to make sense. He, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, 2, starting in verse 16, he says, Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Basically, it's false doctrine that we've talked a lot about. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Listen now. Among them are Hymenius, who we just talked about, and Philetius. Philetius. Who have departed from the truth. Here's what they did. Here's what Hymenius did. This is why Paul handed him over to Satan, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. False doctrine. Hermenius and this other guy is going around preaching that uh, the resurrection, he's talking about the resurrection of the saints has already taken place. Now we know that uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has already taken place. Here, but we're talk he's talking about the resurrection of the saints. And uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, it talks about uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we are left alive, we'll, 
will be uh, risen and will join the Lord in the air and live with Him forever and ever. That's the rapture. So what Paul is upset about is these guys are going around saying the rapture has already taken place. Now he says, who I handed over to Satan not to, uh, to be taught not to blaspheme. In other words, he's kicked them out of the church. He's kicked them out of the church. Now listen closely. We pray to God that we don't that we don't have to cross that bridge anymore here. Removing someone from the caring, nurturing, protection of the church exposes them to Satan in hope that they will seek forgiveness and come back to the church. Now, it doesn't say here that they lost their salvation. It says here that they're teaching false doctrine. Maybe, I don't know what the case was, and maybe they misunderstood, or maybe they were just trying to make up stuff on their own, but Tim, uh, Paul does not put up with it. He, he, he kicks them, he says, kick them out of the church, expose them to the world, get them away from the nurturing, caring, protection of the church, and hopefully they will come to their senses and seek forgiveness and welcome them back in. And they'll start practicing the truth instead of false doctrine. He doesn't say, never say here to kick them out and leave them out. He says here to expose them to Satan, to be taught not to blaspheme. Now, there's another place in Scripture that Paul talks about this same subject. I think it's important we look at it. That's 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Listen to this. Same subject. What is the air conditioner set on? Check it. Little bit warm. Little bit warm. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Now you got your jacket on, you'll be fine. Listen up. <coughs> It is actually reported, now he's, he's talking about the church in Corinth, now the Corinthian church, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone to mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of the Lord is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Same subject. Saying pretty much a different sin, but the same thing. Put them out of the fellowship. Get them away from the nurturing, care, and protection of the church. Expose them to Satan. And hopefully, they will come to their senses, get on their knees, ask the Lord for forgiveness, and then you welcome them back into church. That is the principle of practice to you. Now, keep in mind, who... Who he's writing to, the situations there, um, and how it applied then and how it should apply today. There's actually a prescription in, 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 in Scripture that tells you how to approach someone in your church who is sinning, and you know everybody knows you're sinning. Um, I didn't look it up, but everybody knows what it is. You go to him by yourself or her if they don't listen. You take two or three with you. If they still don't listen, you, you expose it to the church. If you still don't listen, boot him out of the church. Boot him out of the church. Expose him to Satan. Hopefully he'll come. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that you have to do. Because let me tell you something. One bad seed, one bad apple will run a whole bunch of others. Y'all know the saying. If you allow false doctrine to filter, infiltrate the church, if you allow sin to be actively functioning inside the body of Christ, it will damage other people. You have to do what Scripture says. You have to remove them from the congregation. Not trying to be mean, but that is the 
word we find in Scripture. Okay? okay. Now, let's move to chapter 2. Any questions before we move? Remember I had told you when we started this little book that there were going to be seven aspects that should define the healthy church. The first one, there should be sound doctrine in the church. should be sound preaching. No false doctrine. Like I said, Roger is responsible for not only what he teaches, but he's responsible for what I teach. He's responsible for what Johnny teaches, for whoever's leading the women's group. He has to make sure that we're not preaching and teaching false doctrine, which we're not. Um, and I got a, a big praise report that I forgot to mention, but I'm going to mention it now. On the 14th of October, Roger's got to go and, and do a, a, a funeral, a wedding, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to be in Dalton that weekend, so I can't fill in. But Brother Chris is going to fill in. I want to record that now so I can look at it later. I've always said Chris is, a, uh, is called to be a pastor. He just won't come out of the closet. But now he's coming out. Anyway, seven aspects of the healthy church. There should be sound doctrine, sound preaching, preaching straight from the Bible, not veering left or right. False doctrine is adding to Scripture, taking away from Scripture, or just uh, denying Scripture altogether. That's false doctrine. The second is a place of grace. It should be a place of grace. It don't matter what your past is in this church, we are to show grace to that person. If they come in, if they receive Christ as the Lord and Savior, they start a new path in life, we are not to worry about what they did. We are a place of grace. If it wasn't for grace, we wouldn't be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. The Lord is by grace we are saved. Through faith, and it goes on to say that salvation is it's a gift from God. It's nothing we do, it's a gift from God. And you can't earn your way to heaven. The church should be a place of grace. And next, it should be a place of prayer. That's the three we've gotten to so far. Place of prayer. We should be soaking our church in prayer. We should be soaking our congregation in prayer. Our messages should be soaked in prayer before we ever get up and deliver them. Uh, should be a place of prayer. Lots of prayer in the church. Now, let's move on. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Petitions, that's request. Request to God. When we petition God, we're asking Him uh, to you know, when we get a list of prayer requests, we're asking God to work in these people's lives. That's petition. Prayers, that's a wrong term for all prayers in the church. Intercession. What is intercession? Anybody know? Praying someone else. Yeah. But someone that has a hard need that they can't feel like they can pray for themselves, so we pray for them. Yeah, we, we stand in on behalf of others. We've done it a lot here in our church where someone will come up front and they're standing in for somebody that can't make it that actually needs prayer. And we go up and we lay hands on that person and through we, that's intercession. We're praying for this person that they're, they're wanting to see be healed or whatever the situation might be going on. So he mentions intercession uh, and he also mentions thanksgiving for all the people. That's just being thankful for our congregation, being thankful for what God is doing in our congregation. We have an amazing little church here. God is working in mighty ways here. You can see it all over the place. Now, let's move on, Toby. This is going to be interesting for you. <clears throat> for kings and all those in authority, Toby, uh, <laughs> President Biden, that we may... No, let me go. Let me stop. We need to be praying for our government. Even though we disagree with our, some of what's going on, we need to pray for them people. We really need to pray for them. Uh, God, in, in Scripture, it says God has control over the heart of the king. God has control over the heart of our government, but we need to be praying for these people. We need to pray. Because there's an advantage to this. 
We gain something out of this by praying for our kings and our government. It says, it goes on to say that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That's the advantage for praying for the government. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Verse 3. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Who wants all people to be saved? You know, y'all y'all heard of predestination. There's a lot of people, a lot of religions, well not, not no. Let me go back and say there's a lot of pastors that teach false doctrine. They say that God predestined so many people to get saved and so many people not to get saved. That is simply not the truth. John 3.16 says he loves the whole world. Right here he says he, that all should be saved. God wants all human beings that's ever born on the face of this earth to come to Him and ask for Christ in their life. To ask to be saved. He does not exclude anybody. What predestination means is you can't put God in a box. He's already he's here, He's back there. He's already at the end. He's already with us in heaven. He knows all things. In other words, God already knows who's going to get saved and who's not. He does not limit who can get saved and who can't, but He already knows because He's everywhere. You cannot put God in a box. That's pretty much what predestination is. He already knows. It's interesting here that Paul's asking for prayer for kings and those in authority. Guess who was in authority? Uh, who was the, uh, the Roman emperor at the time that he's Nero. writing this book? Nero. Nero, yes. Nero, who would end up uh, ordering Paul to be beheaded. The same one. He was in authority there from 54 AD to 68 AD. A long little run for Nero. And I can't, I'm not even going to go into that. I've talked a lot about that evil man. Uh, he's done a lot of evil, evil, evil stuff. He, he hated Christians. He did nasty things to Christians. Burn them up. Throw them to lions. Throw them to dogs. You name it, he did it to them. Anyway, a bad, bad man. But believe it or not, if Nero would have got on his knees and asked for forgiveness, in the end, he would go to heaven too. All sins can be forgiven. All sins can be forgiven. This mass murderers has been in prison for killing all kind of people, doing all kind of nasty things. But if they humble themselves and give their total life to Christ and ask Him to forgive them and come to their heart, they too can be forgiven. They have been. Story after story of just evil people giving their life to Christ. Let's move on. For there is one God, he mentions it again, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Now this has been witnessed to at a proper time. For this, for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentile. Now, let's talk about a mediator. A mediator. Jesus is the mediator between us and the Father. God the Father. What does that mean? And let me give you an example. Say you were, you got thrown out in the ocean by mistake, you fell off a cruise ship or something, and you swim and you swim and you swim for a whole day and you give slap out, but you're still on top and you're still trying to swim. And a boat spots you and the boat comes over to rescue you. So you've got you, the weak person in the water that is given all the strength. You're, you're lost. You're, you're just <clears throat> wiped out. And then you've got the boat as the rescuer, but you don't have enough strength to lift yourself up in the boat. And the boat people are not going to pick you up out of the water. So you need a mediator. So luckily there'd be somebody 
that's not operating the boat to come to the front of the boat to reach down and pick you up. I, that's the mediator between you and the boat. You need somebody to help you get in the boat. Same way with Jesus. He is the mediator between us and the Father. We need somebody to help us get back to the Father. And that is Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the only way back to the Father. He is the mediator. He's the one that's going to lift you out of your bad situation. He's the one that's going to save you from that bad situation. And He's going to be the one to present you to the Father. Now, I'm not talking about two gods. I'm talking about one God. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Don't ever let that confuse you. Let's move on. Now we're starting to get into some touchy things here. Now, women, I want you to listen up. I don't want you to get offended right off the bat because I'm going to explain this the best way I know how. Okay? Don't let what Scripture says upset you. We're going to talk about it. Talk a lot about it. i got 15 minutes to talk about it. I might not even get through. But let me tell you something. Christianity is the one religion, or we like to say it's a relationship, that values and validates women The one religion, the one relationship, Christianity, that shows women some sort of value. Look how tenderly Jesus was with women. No other religion in the world treats women like Christianity. Muslim women can't say that. Hindu women can't say that. Buddhist women can't say that. Not even Jewish women can say that. They're the practicing Judaism. Christianity is the only religion, relationship that puts a value on women. Okay? Keep that in mind. Verse 8. Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. That's more, that's the key right there. Yeah. Men everywhere to pray. Pray. To lift up holy hands hand. without any anger or disputing. Let me tell you something. Not, not putting women down on a lower level because they're not. I'm going to get to that. But men are called to be the spiritual leader in the home, set the spiritual example, example in the home and in the church. I, I listened to a survey done about women, and they said, the question is, what is your number one concern about men? And you know what it was? The women said, the number one concern is their, their concern about men in our century being raised up to be spiritual leaders. They're, that's their concern, that their husband will be a spiritual leader, that their Friends will be spiritual leaders because it's not happening like it used to happen. We got men just raising up to turn into women now. It's all kind of crazy. Thing. That was their main concern that the men of this world will be raised up and be spiritual leaders to set the example. All right, let me move on. I also want women to dress modestly with decency. And priority, propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. <laughs> for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But, woman, but women will, will uh, hold up, will, will be saved to childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness and propriety. How do you pronounce that? Propriety. Propriety, yeah. Now, you heard what it said. Let's see what it means. First of all, we know talks about men being spiritual leaders. Then it goes on to talk about women. So we're going to talk about this 
And I'm going to explain it to you the best way I can. But you have to listen up. Okay? We're going to start all the way back at the creation story. <coughs> Y'all listen up. Go ahead. Listen up, women. It, said, it, it means what? It means what it says. How you go that? It says what it means, not what it says. Listen up. We have to go back to the beginning. In the beginning, the creation story reveals full equality of man and women in God's original plan. Both, as both were made in the image of God. Full equality. Equal. Man and woman in the beginning. Equal. That's in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. A man, and it goes on to say, a man and woman should unite and become one flesh. One flesh. The two together makes one flesh. Women are not to be under the man. They're created equal. They're both created in God's image. And God gave them full authority over the earth and all the earthly form. That's Genesis 1, 28 through 30. So both the man and the woman have full authority over the earth and the animals, the things of the earth. Listen, this plan, this perfect plan that God had in the garden for the man and the woman to live in full equality, to live as equal, got interrupted by the fall as human sin brought the wife's submission to her husband. That's found in Genesis 3, verse 16. The fall brought the wife's submission to her husband. But even then, God spoke of his redemptive plan as he foretold that Eve's descendant would crush Satan beneath his heel. Genesis 3 15. He's talking about Jesus here. That the woman's descendant would come back and crush Satan beneath his heel and bring back the original plan of equality between men and women. Let's go on. The redemptive purpose and mission of Jesus is to redeem all humanity from the results of the fall, including the subjection of women, and bring them back to full equality. That's what Jesus came for, to save all of mankind and to bring back the original plan of creation where men and women were created both in the image of God, equal, given full authority, equal to the earth. So we got, in the beginning, we got equality between man and woman. Not less, not more, but equal. The fall, when, the, when they sinned in the garden, and it caused the fall of mankind, sin came into the world, that brought submission to from the, the woman to the in other words, it brought her under the husband, submission to the husband. Brought him, made him a little higher than the woman. But that's not God's plan. It's only because of the fall. So Jesus' purpose for coming is, first of all, to save mankind. Save everybody from their sin. Uh, to eventually take them to heaven with them. But it's also to bring back the original plan. Now, let's go on and look. In the Old Testament, we'll give you some examples of, of women being used now. We're going to start in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God Himself initiated opportunities to call, use, and bless women in ministry. God used Mary as both a prophetess and a leader in Exodus 15 20 and Micah 6 4. He also used Deborah as a prophetess and a judge who led Israel. She directed Barak as how military victory was to be won, and listen to it, and she even accompanied, accompanied, accompanied him in battle, Judges 4.4. 4. Now, that's the Old Testament. Let's look a little bit more at the Old Testament. God used the prophetess Hilda, even though Jeremiah and Zephaniah were prophets at the time to spark a great religious revival during the reign of Hosea. 2 Kings 12, 14, 2 Chronicles 32, 34, 22. 
and God predicted through the Old Testament prophet Joel that the coming of the long expected day of the Lord now this is Pentecost we're talking about Joel predicted it back in the Old Testament God used Joel to predict this and listen to what it says that when the Holy Spirit will be poured out on both men and women, and they and their sons and daughters would prophesy. That's what happened at Pentecost. We're going to talk a little bit more about that a little later. Now, let's talk about the New Testament a little bit. Jesus showed very positive openness to women as co-laborers. He ministered to both men and women alike without distinction. He shared the good news with the Samaritan woman. That's breaking all the cultural taboo there because the Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. They hated them. But Jesus, instead, the Jews would walk around Samaria to get to where they were going. But Jesus, he goes right on in Samaria. Said, said well, and he shares the good news with the Samaritan woman who then evangelizes her whole village. Jesus was tender with women. He was accompanied by women who ministered to him and his disciples. And Jesus chose a woman to be the first to see him after the resurrection and to be the first to carry the message of the resurrection to the male disciples, a woman that Jesus chose. Now, let's talk about Pentecost. Y'all know what Pentecost is. That's when they were all gathered to one of their festivals. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believers. Pentecost. At Pentecost, both men and women were awaiting the fulfillment of Jesus' promise that they would receive power for witnessing to the world when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Acts 1, verses 13 through 15. It was a group of men and women that was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and began to speak in many languages to the Jews assembled in Jerusalem for the festival. Peter took the occasion to say, this is it. He said, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about. This is it. Peter himself said that. Which Joel had predicted, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And on my servants, both men and women, I will pour up my spirit in those days. So see, God didn't pour out His Holy Spirit just on men, on men and women. He's bringing back full equality. You see what I'm saying? This is Jesus' purpose. So the birth of, of Christ church will be accompanied by a demonstration and announcement that men and women would both serve as God's voices to carry the message of Christ to the world. Now we're going we're gonna to talk about this, then we're going to get back to what Paul said, okay? You just got to listen. Let's talk about what Paul <coughs> said here a little bit. In the ministry of Paul, Paul reflected Jesus' openness to women as co-laborers. It was probably the first epistle that he wrote. He declared that in Jesus Christ, listen, there is neither male nor female, for you all are one in Jesus Christ. That's Galatians 3.28. And writing to the Corinthians, he recognized that women prophesied and prayed and public worship. Now this is the man talking here that just wrote what I read in Scripture, okay? That prayed in public worship under the new order, 1 Corinthians 11, 15. When closing his letter to the Romans, Paul mentions ten women in chapter 16, seven of whom he speaks with detailed high commendation, referring to one as a deacon, that was Phoebe, who had been a great help to many, including Paul himself. Referring to one as outstanding among the apostles. So he's calling one an apostle. Referring to one as a fellow worker. And referring to those who had worked hard in the Lord as for the role of believers. In Philippians 4, uh, 2 and 3, he mentions two women who had contended at, at my side in the cause of the gospel. Uh, and like I said, in Romans 16, 1, he calls Phoebe a deacon. Not a deaconess, but a deacon. So this is Paul saying the same thing, saying all this, who just wrote this. Let me tell you something. Peter, and we, we studied second, first and second Peter, in 2 Peter 3.16, y'all remember what Peter said about Paul's writings? 
he said his letters, talking about Paul's, contain some things that are hard to understand which ignorant and unstable people distort. You can't just read this little bit here without looking at the context of things. You've got to look at the culture. You've got to look at the church he's writing to. Uh, what are some of the things that have been said about that church that he's writing to? What are some of the things happening here? Uh, one rule of spiritual interpretation is that passages that are unclear are to be interpreted in the light of the clear ones. So I just gave you a bunch of clear ones where creation, God created man and, and woman equal, not one above the other, equal. That equality got disrupted by the fall, which put women in submission to their husband. But Jesus' purpose for coming was first to save the people, save us from our sins, and to bring back God's original plan for men and women. Okay? Just as the Lord led, just as the Lord provided opportunities in the Old Testament for women to lead, to lead, just, uh, to live, to live within the teachings of Scripture, we must work counterculturally to provide women with increasing opportunities to answer the call of God. So what is Paul saying here? But first I want to read you something. This is the Wesleyan view of women in ministry. The Wesleyan view of women in ministry. Listen up. The Wesleyan church wishes to re re reaffirm its long-standing commitment to full opportunity to women to be ordained in the ministry and to serve in any and all ministerial and leadership capacities. That's the Wesleyan view of women. They have full right to serve in any capacity that the Lord calls them to serve in. You don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a preacher or I'm going to be a teacher, although some people do that for the money and they think it's an easy job. Women and men alike who are preachers and teachers are called by God to do that. Not just because you want to, because a lot of times we run from our calling. We're scared of our calling. <laughs> but if you're called by God to preach your church, if you don't do it, you're going to be one miserable individual. So what does Paul say in this, these verses about women here? What is he saying? We have to look at the source. Who is he writing to? What problems have been revealed in Scripture concerning the church? Now, first of all, the main topic that he's been talking about that's happening in the church is what? What's the main sin going on? False doctrine. false doctrine. A lot of false doctrine being taught. Also, if you know anything about synagogue's teaching, now this is Jewish Judaism, which Paul would be very familiar with. In a synagogue, women sat on one side, men on the other, it's a little petition in between. And they had a problem with the priest would be teaching and the woman might not, not understand what he's saying and she would shout across to her husband, what does that mean? You know, disrupting the class. And Paul was very familiar with that. So some of these women in the Ephesian church may have been disrupting worship service by talking out loud, not only to their husband, but to each other. You know how women would get over there and be talking? And, I thought we were evil. I'll be saying, oh, I'll, I'll, just talk, I'll just quit talking if I see somebody talking over there. But, and also, it could have been women that's new in the faith, still on spiritual milk, not really qualified to teach or preach. Because Paul, I mean, he, he talks so much about the women that helped him, calls one a deacon, calls call another one uh, uh, an apostle. So it ain't like he's got 
anything against women preaching and teaching, but he's writing to a specific culture, a specific church, not to churches all over. He's writing to the church of Ephesus. He's writing to Timothy, who was the pastor there. There could have been problems going on in the church. Uh, they might, like I said, they may have said separately, and the women uh, were hollering back to to their husband. What does that mean? Whereas they should have just been quiet and let the husband explain to them when they got home what it meant. So you you got to consider all these factors when you read this. We as global Methodists now, we I don't know how many women they ordained to preach, but I'm sure there's several. We don't uh, we don't put a, a a barrier between women and their calling. We don't do that in this church for sure. Um, if you're called to be a teacher in this church, we allow you to teach, you know. We've had a long, several women preachers here. Donna was a good preacher. We all loved her, you know. So don't let what's said here upset you in any way. But I do want to talk about the dress a little bit. Uh, when he talks about a woman dressing modestly in, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves with elaborate hairstyles, he, he's not really talking about women revealing themselves sexually because they didn't have that problem back in those days. Women dressed a certain way and they didn't show their body like we would do today. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the richer women in the church dressing all up fancy with all their gold and their fancy hairdos coming to a church that had a lot of poor folks in it. You know, he just saying, you don't do that. You know, if you're, if you're rich and you got all these fancy clothes and stuff, don't wear them to the worship service. Try to be equal with everybody in the service. You know, we can apply this verse today and say, you know, don't come to our church with little mini skirts on and stuff like that. We don't have to worry about that because nobody does that. And none of us are so rich that we put on these all these fancy clothes and these fancy hairdos uh, and put on all this jewelry to try to stand out from everybody. We don't have that problem. So all he's saying here to these women is look, don't come show yourself off at church about your riches. Just come and, and dress like everybody else and be like everybody else and worship service will go a lot better. Now, there's a statement here that's very hard to understand and that's the last one. A lot of them are going to quit. It's, I will talk about it next week. It's the woman being saved through childbearing. We're going to talk about that next week. I didn't realize that going so far. Right, let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that I got carried away tonight and went over. Maybe it was for a reason. We once again uh, just ask you to touch anybody in this congregation who has not received you as Lord and Savior. We ask you to woo them in, Father. We ask you to disturb your soul. Bring them to you, Lord. Uh, just make them not rest, uh, Father, and if, if it's their day of salvation. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your precious son. Thank you for this opportunity to come study. Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.